I've got this rock star uh, mic on, so I'm just really tempted to sing. But lucky for you, I'm going to stifle that impulse. <laughs> All right. So, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is a study I did with two other people. I'll tell you a little bit about how and why we did it and some of the data from it. We're not going to get through all of my slides in 20 minutes, but I'll do as much as I can and then roll a few. You can take a look and ask questions about them if I didn't get to them. Um, I am going to be actually, I, I did another uh, book called, it just came out called uh, Dating After 50 for Dummies. Um, it's part of the Dummy series. And um, I'm going to be on, I le leave tomorrow to do the Today Show Wednesday on that. So if you're looking at the 10 a.m. hour, because they do Sochi first, I'll be there stricken um, talking about this, this book. But not this book. This book today I'm going to talk about is um, a book that came out about a year ago. It was on the New York Times bestseller little for a couple weeks. Um, I'm a bit of a maverick in academia. I like to write books that go take good research or the best research we can do anyhow and get the data out to people who are interested in it. And um, this is kind of a real quick review of, of how we did it. Um, I know lots of people particularly if you're interested in a science cafe, I like to know how people came up with the answers they did. And so I could take too much time on that. I want to give you some data, but I want you to have some hooks to hang your questions on if that's the kind of questions you like to ask. Uh, basically, it's an internet study. Um, we did it on five very different uh, internet sites in the United States, AOL, Huffington Post, iVillage, AARP, um, and... Um, am I forgetting? Something, oh, Reader's Digest. So we did that. Um, and uh, we had kind of an interesting reinforcement schedule. If you answered X number of questions, you got to read a cartoon. If you liked our cartoons, you kept answering. Uh, 17 pods of questions. So if you didn't want to, if you answer stuff, or if you got tired, you could stop and come back. We're probably at about 100,000 people now, and it's in all these other countries as well. Some of these countries were random samples. For those of you who understand what a random sample is, it just means that it has a much better chance of actually describing the whole population. It's not skewed in a way. And so we translated the study in seven or eight languages and did random samples in France, Italy, Spain, Hungary, um, and China. I think the rest were more convenient samples. We looked at both same and opposite sex couples. I'm not going to talk about the differences that much because there weren't that many differences. This, there's some um, are different ab about gay males have different philosophies about non-monogamy. Uh, lesbians, as you might imagine, being women, um, have more distinctive patterns of affection. And romance, we'll talk a little bit about that. But basically, the couples didn't differentiate that much from one another that so we called it the normal bar. What do we mean by normal? If, if you're, most of us, our hackles raise when we hear normal, and, and we don't want to be normal. It sounds boring. Um, what we mean by normal is just what you do every day. You know, do you, if your normal is brushing your teeth before and after breakfast, that's your normal. Other people take their brush, toothbrush with them to lunch. You know, is there any data that says that's, who knows what the data is? It's just your normal. So we wanted to look at what normal was uh, related to people's durability and uh, happiness and a few other things. And um, we also understand that our normal is not necessarily in our DNA. I'm a sociologist. I think our normal often changes with our age, circumstances, our life, the person we're with now versus another person another time in our life. So normal doesn't mean it's necessarily stuck in concrete. It's what you do now. Um, and for men and women in our study, basically it was very clear. We asked people what was the most important thing to them in their lives? What was most highly related to their happiness? And as you can see from this, uh, the relationship won by a long shot. And that includes some fairly compelling things like extended family, career, money, faith, health, children. Um, you, the red is the female answers, the blue is the male answers. They're, they're relatively similar and it's very clear that if people's relationship isn't going well, 
their happiness isn't likely to be going very high either. There's a few things that I think are really interesting about this study. People always ask me in interviews, I hate this question, what's the most interesting thing you found or what's the biggest surprise? You know, I don't rank them that way, but I have to say that one of the most important things that I found out, I think that's my dinner. <laughs> that's mine. Put that over there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I have to defend my food. It's a very mammalian trait. Um, anyhow, another mammalian trait. Um, I was very interested in how important affectionate behaviors are. There's a few things that I think people might consider modest, but in our study, we found, and I'm going to talk about these a little, that these things, hand-holding, public displays of affection, spontaneous kissing, cuddling, calling somebody by a pet name, those were highly correlated. Correlation, of course, is not causation, but highly correlated to happiness. And I will talk a little bit more about that. Um, found that c here's a, a survey of couples who hold hands at least several times a week. Um, the um, average was about 61% of them held hands at least um, time, so several times a week. That's not very interesting. But what is interesting is what wh how high it is and how low it goes. <laughs> One of the uh, interesting things, now holding hands is pretty simple, uh, affectionate behavior, right? I mean, you can do it in public. Nobody comments. Um, and uh, this, unfortunately, chart looks the same in quite a few behaviors. Th they seem to attenuate even in happy couples, although happier couples are always going to be higher on all these measures than other couples. But you can see that uh, slightly less than half of people, by the time they're with 10 years or more, um, are still holding hands. So you know, that goes down by a quarter or so. And um, I think that the lesson for me here is to not let this slide happen in things that really make people happy. Um, behaviors of extremely happy couples. These are high numbers. 88% say I love you daily. 74% give and get back rubs. Although I must say that women give a little more. Um, cuddling at least twice a week. This is an interesting one. If you're childless and happy, 82% of you cuddle at least once a week. But if you're parents, 68% <laughs> of you do. That's a 20% different. I think maybe the kids are in there, you know, or, at le or making you very tired and don't cuddle. I just want to sleep. 76% of our happy couples use pet names. What do I mean by pet names? Honey, sweetie, babe, just stuff like that. Um, and, when we and when we ask the people if they didn't get called a pet name, would they like that? This kind of surprised me. 50% of people who said they didn't get one would like it. So, you know, babe, honey, sweetie, darling, hey, good looking, stuff like that. They're useful. Public displays of affection. This is interesting. Now, public display of affection just means hugging or kissing in public, okay? Or, I mean, we didn't count holding hands on this one. Um, in the United States, 40% of people say they never or rarely do that. And uh, only 13% said that's sort of part of their normal, that they do it every, every week. But it's not true in European companies. France, Italy, Spain, it's um, sometimes I say, you know, if you really want a very affectionate, warm, loving, uninhibited person, you know, try and be Spanish. <coughs> um, or, or, you know, pick up somebody Latin or, you know, Southern European because we Americans seem to be very constrained about this if we have gotten too far from our earlier ethnic, you know, identifications. Um, and uh, public displays of affection are something you see in very happy couples. Spontaneous kissing. By kissing here we meant um, that was not done during lovemaking just because you like the person, love the person. 58% of our extremely happy couples say they kiss just for the heck of it at least a few times a week. Um, in our general sample, only 35% of our men said they did, and 24% of the men said they never had sex with their part. Excuse me, they never had spontaneous kissing with their partner except if they were making love. 
which I think is kind of fascinating. Um, of course, here we are, the winners. Uh, <laughs> once again, the most passionate kissing, 75% of our Italians and 72% of the Spanish and assorted South Americans. Um, that seems to be just something they do. Compliments. I think this is really interesting. 39% of, of the men in the study and 24% of the women said their partner hardly or never says they look nice. Now, we could, we could do better than that, can't we? <laughs> um, and it's interesting. You'll find a kind of a general rule. Women get more compliments than they give. Men give more compliments than they get. So it's an interesting kind of thing. Women talk about you know, not getting often enough romance and stuff like that, but they're not saying a lot of nice things to their partner often enough, I think. Romance. This was another finding I thought was kind of interesting. In the United States, more men talk about being ra romance deprived than women do. Um, this isn't more universal. Our Asian study, the women were much more romance starved than the men. Men were much take it or leave it. But in America, the men f definitely in, in uh, significant numbers say they would like t their partners to be more romantic with them. When we ask them, okay, that's what you'd like, but do you feel deprived? I mean, is this really important to you? Uh, in the United States, 30% of the women said they felt deprived, 60% of the men. Now, that's a statistically, I mean, you don't have to be a statistician to know that's a big difference. Um, flips over if you go to China. And we did have this uh, study um, uh, translated into Mandarin, so it's not all of China, but it's at least a major language. 69% um, of the women said that they felt deprived and 47% of the men. Um, and it goes down, if you get to go down to the romance countries, fewer and fewer men feel deprived. Over a while you get the picture. <laughs> Most bothered by lack of, of romance in the United States, again, 29% of women were um, really bothered than 44% of men. Um, Interesting, we tend like to look at like what's what's going on with people in these relationships. So we ask people if they felt their partner took care to look nice for them. 43% of these couples said their partner isn't taking care of themselves. And a third of these men and women wish their partner would try harder. The happiest couples in our sample said they really felt their partner, overwhelmingly felt their partner made an effort. Romantic getaways. I'm a big fan of this. I'm actually writing a book on romantic travel. 88% of our extremely happy couples take them. 88%. That's just about everybody. 25% of the uh, general American population take them. And we didn't code for income on the happiest couples, so that means lower income as well as higher incomes. Uh, Same-sex couples seem to take them more often, but it's really interesting. I once saw a statistic on this. The average um, American worker only gets two weeks of vacation a year, unlike France and some of these other places that have, it seems to me, a much more civilized approach to, to living. But what really is interesting is that only half of people who have a vacation take it at all. So the idea that these happy couples have taken the time for each other, I think is really important. And in France, Italy, Spain, they all take their six weeks or more. I mean, it's just like, what? don't take vacations together. Percentage who say they don't go romantic gifts. 52% of the women said they didn't. 62% of the men, much lower in France and in Italy. Communication issues. Well, people, you know, whenever anybody says, what does it take to make a good relationship? Almost everybody says communication. Um, but people have trouble with that, and uh, they often don't talk about sort of the lingua franca of what makes a couple different than roommates, which is some kind of sensual or sexual life. Um, male and female couples are much more explicit and open in talking about these kinds of things than heterosexual couples are. It's one of the places they do have a difference. And um, what we think is interesting is there's so much miscommunication going on with the very little communication that does go on. 53% of the men in this study said they thought their wife was having sex purely out of obli obligation. 
But 30, only 37%, which is a third, mind you, that's a lot of people. But a third, only about a little over a third said it's true. So some of those men think their partner is doing this because they have to, and it's not true. Almost none of our really happy couple said that happened in their relationships. Almost none. Frequency, everybody cares. I'm not sure why, um, because I suppose they want to see how they link up. But as you might imagine, there's much more going on in the Italians and the French. And happy couples do it more than unhappy, and there is an age effect. 70% of couples are not ha being with each other at all. Um, people care. Um, highest people cared about what happened with their partner were the French. But it was pretty high for everybody, two-thirds percent. I think, guess if you don't care, you're unlikely to be a happy couple. What they think of their each other's uh, efforts. Uh, fortunately, I thought this was good for the Olympics. Um, <laughs> this is the old scoring system, but still I remember it. Um, this is what men and women said they wanted more of in their sex lives. Men wanted more different things. They wanted uh, less specificity. I thought it was interesting. They would like to know what's going on with their partner. So if she would just make a few noises, they would know. <laughs> so they said sexual noises, like, am I, is this okay? Am I doing okay? Um, women said they wanted more foreplay. My favorite um, joke on that is something uh, by a uh, Terry Foya psychologist who said, uh, the reason that some women um, fake orgasm is that most men fake foreplay. <laughs> and <laughs> so, they're, so they're saying, like, would you touch us more? Um, and more romance, he'd like that too, as we know, and less predictability, which is very similar to what men were talking. So we thought these two people, if they could talk and tell each other a little more honestly, might do better. How do you rate your partner's kissing? Now, I think this is a really interesting thing. Um, only a third of the women and a little over a quarter of the men would give their partners a 9 or 10 on kissing. And uh, that's much higher in the Latins, but it's still not uniform. Now, I think kissing is one of those things you could talk about and get to a place where you really could get a higher rating, right? But I think people are so afraid of talking about this stuff that they don't, and so they don't get very high ratings, or at least not enough of them do. Do you consider your partner a passionate lover or best friend? One thing I'd like to say is that it's far more likely, you could only in this thing say one, it's much more likely in those Latin and, and uh, uh, Southern European countries for the first thing that they label their partner as a passionate lover, and that is not as likely in America. We, when in our happy couples, are much more likely to say best friend than passionate lover. It's almost like we don't think that's the right category for a partner. So if you look at the bottom, it's us in Canada. <laughs> So the correlation between the way you see your sex life and relationship happiness is positive. It's sort of people who are really in our happy couples tend to rate them pretty highly. Um, and um, it, they, this sort of says, I'm not going to get stuck on this stuff, but, but basically, <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not likely to be happy if that's what they're saying. Um, and things basically diminish over time. I mean, um, we all know that one of the biggest culprit of, of this kind of physical relationship is kids. In this cartoon, it says, hi, sweetheart, I'm sure it won't be for long, before long where we'll be able to sit next to each other again. I mean, kids do, in fact, shift the entire emotional weight and the quality of time in a different direction. Um, and I'm not going to go into a bunch of these things, but a lot of this stuff, you'll just notice a shift over 10 years duration of the relationship, whether it's um, something like kissing or it's something um, like holding hands, um, even saying I love you. Um, the happiest couples do it, but it goes down um, uh, in over, over time and age with a lot of people. Um, this th kind of thing, for example, say having sex out of obligation, only 12% people say that in a relationship of one year or less. You look at 21 years, and it goes way up. So I'm not going to do all of this, but I would like to talk about um, that basically um, we find that couples who are really happy innovate. <laughs> they may not innovate this much. Um, <laughs> and uh, misunderstand each other, but 
but general category i don't just mean um in the sex lives i mean all over in terms of trips or things like that um that we find and this is really interesting when i talk about fantasies that last was a chart using vibrators is the as the verticals um we did this study right before the big surge of of buying came out for shades of gray 50 shades of gray do you know that that book has sold out more than the Bible? Do you know that book has sold more than Harry Potter? So that's a sociological phenomenon. The fact that, and it's mostly bought by women, the fact that that's in such a big deal, that thing, makes me think that there's things going on that are unexpressed between people so that, you know, pe women either embarrassment or cultural taboos or whatever, they pour their, their erotic psyches in these books and their husbands and maybe even their friends never know. But basically people are, um, what their fantasies are, are people they've seen, people they've met. 90% of our men said they fantasize about people they've met um, and or their partner's friends. I think it's really behooves us all to, buy, to get extremely unattractive friends. Um, <laughs> People often have fantasies during lovemaking, but we thought this was interesting. What was the number one thing that married heterosexual men fantasized about? Their wives, which is I just kind of think sweet. Now their wives were doing things they don't normally do in these fantasies, but nonetheless they were included, which I thought was very nice. And women included their their husbands as well. Well, we took a lot about relationships, and I think the interesting thing is we, of course are very um, strong about monogamy. It's part of the wedding vows. Not no, Nobody, very few, I should say, people sign up for something that is not, non not monogamous. But there's a, there's a psyche going on here that is perhaps not practiced, but thought of. We asked people, if you could have sex outside your relationship and have zero effect on your relationship, would you? These are the high numbers. 65% of men, 43% of women, and they were high in the happy couples. So we think these fantasies, which most people do not activate, um, are not fantasies of always of discontent, but rather of imagination. Um, is it just a matter of opportunity? Would you be tempted if somebody propositioned you? A lot of people would. By an old friend, it's interesting, more women than men. So do we know what's really happening? So here's an interesting thing. We talked these now, we wanted to know about secrets, communication between men and women. I only have a few more times for my stuff. Major secrets. This is now, I'm not just, I, we exclude sexual stuff from this, this, this question. This does not include affairs or stuff like that, okay? We wanted to know communication with couples because going on. What's a major secret? I told my partner I have a degree and I don't. Uh, I went to college and I didn't um that we're doing fine and we're in debt i mean big secrets right those are big secrets 43 percent of the men 33 percent of the women said they had major secrets from their partner and even a quarter of our happiest couples kept major secrets now what's interesting is that secrets are a way of life in france and italy <laughs> americans think you know, you're in love, it's honest, you tell each other everything. A major secret might be a cause for divorce or sense of betrayal. The French and Italian people our study said, get out of here, it's our business. I mean, we don't have to tell these things. I mean, they had a total different thing about it. They didn't feel guilty about the secrets. They felt they were entitled to have the secrets. Now, in terms of just sex, because we've been talking about it, about a quarter of men and 43% of women, so quite a few women than men, uh, don't give accurate feedback about how much they're enjoying what's going on. And that goes on with age. Maybe we could talk about that. And yet, and here's my last couple things to say, we were struck by how many of our couples were happy and how many couples, and, and actually I have to say the nobility of men in many ways. 93% of men would risk their life for their partner um, even if they didn't love her anymore. 97% would if they were happy couples. 78% of women would risk their part life for their partner 
If they loved him, if they were having a bad relationship, he is going to die. <laughs> so women were, you know, maybe they felt like they weren't as physically capable. Maybe they thought about their kids. But really, if you are in trouble, you really want a man around <laughs> because he's likely to risk his life for you. 75% um, of couples would choose each other again. And I think that's a very high statement. 70% um, of our couples felt their partner loved them more now than early in their relationship, and 25% said just as much. So very few really felt that love had gone down. Even if all these behaviors seemed to have attenuated, love was still intact. People were still very attracted to their partner, very high in, very in almost all these countries. We were pretty, pretty high as well. And that included people all over the life cycle, which I think sometimes people get phobic about aging, but their partners really are still attracted to them. So there's some challenges in these data, but also a lot of positives. Um, a lot of our, our older uh, people in this study, I actually am the AARP Love and Relationship Ambassador, so I tend to look at people over 50 as a special group. And then for them, it's still sex, drugs, and rock and roll, just different drugs that we need now. <laughs> They're reading my books, of course. So there we are. That's, that's, that's my using every last second of my 30 minutes. Um, we get a break, and then maybe you can ask me some questions about a lot of the data that I've thrown at you. Let's have a huge round of applause for, uh, for Pepper. Thank you.